Welcome. Thank you all for coming this evening on this not so nice spring evening. Uh, there's a few snowflakes out earlier. I'm Judy McDowell and I'm the coordinator of the Woods Hole Sea Grant program and I'd like to welcome you to our first uh, Oceans Alive lecture for this season. I think we're truly honored to have four speakers um, from Falmouth High School and Falmouth Academy who are recent recipients of not only the local science fairs, but have recently been honored uh, at the regional science fair as well. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce these future scientists to you this evening. This is the kickoff lecture for our, our spring Oceans Alive lecture series, which will be held the next five, well, tonight and four more Tuesdays, um, in Redfield Auditorium at 7.30. And there's a change in, in next week's schedule. Dave Aubrey, who was scheduled to give a, a presentation on the Caspian Sea next Tuesday, will actually be in Eastern Europe, in the vicinity of the Caspian Sea next week. And so he has switched his schedule with Kenny Abrams, who will present uh, a lecture next week on saltwater fly fishing for striped bass. So that's the only schedule. The rest of the schedule remains the same. Dave will make his presentation on April 26. Okay. Our four speakers this evening are all accomplished scientists already. Andrea Gordon, Zoli Zutz, Kira Grant, and Jessica Shade. Our first speaker this evening will be Andrea Gordon. And Andrea's project is on the effects of ultraviolet B radiation on Cape soil microbes, phase two. It earned her a first place award in the Falmouth Academy Science Fair, a $1,000 scholarship from Huey, and this past weekend, she got a first place ranking um, in the regional science fair and was invited to attend the international science and engineering fair to be held in Alabama in May. And she's a ninth grader at Falmouth Academy. So please, let's give a, a warm welcome to Andrea Gordon and she'll present her results. I should also mention that all our science fair winners are front page in the Enterprise this evening. Hi, good evening. My name is Andrea Gordon. And the science project that I conducted this year was on the effects of ultraviolet B radiation on Cape soil microbes. The reason why I picked this project is because of its imperative need of explanation and um, just, you know, what's going on with our present day situation, such as the ozone depletion as shown here in this slide. The left hand side of this slide is the present day situation, which is just a band of ozone surrounding our planet, which protects us from harmful ultraviolet B and A radiation. As you can see, some radiation does penetrate our atmosphere, but currently is not causing too much problems. On the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the future danger of the ozone depletion. More radiation will be reaching the soil of our planet and possibly causing many more problems. The reason why I chose to work with soil microbes, because they're the basis of most of the energy and nutrient cycles of our planet. If we did not have the microbes within our soil, all living matter would become non-living matter. I isolated approximately 40 microbes out of this planting bed in Yarmouth Port. Transferred the soil sterilely to the Cape Cod Hospital's Microbiology and Bacteriology Lab, where I centrifuged the material along with normal saline and tryptocase soy growth media at 500 Gs for five minutes. As you can see, there's a layer of floating debris and a layer of solid debris within the middle and the lighter brown band, there are two liquid layers. Last year, I conducted a similar experiment and found that both of these liquid layers yielded identical microbes. So this year, I only used the top liquid layer. Here I am in the lab, setting up my original isolation plates from the top liquid layer of the centrifuge material. I used five different types of auger plates, 5% cheap lead with tryptocase soy broth, 5% cheap lead with CNA, which is colosinalodisic acid, 
chocolate agar, as shown here in this slide, um, which is just cooked 5% cheap blood and tryptocase soy broth, a Maconky agar, and a Saburo dextrose agar. Once the, all of the microbes were put into a pure culture, and six organisms were chosen for ultraviolet exposure. These are the six organisms that were chosen. I then identified all of my microbes, including those that were not being used in the ultraviolet experiments. Used a number of methods. First, um, this API 20E strip, which identifies gram positive bacilli. It's a strip which identifies the microbe by conducting multi biochemical tests on them. These results are shown by um, changing color and production of bubbles and so forth. As shown in this slide, supplementary test was run after the initial readings were done. And this is a positive nitrate reduction test. To finalize the identification results of the gram positive bacilli, I had to run an API CH50B strip, as shown here, when both of the results from the two different types of strips were combined, then an identification could be made. Here is a automatic form of the manual form of the API, which is called a Vitek identification card. As shown by the letters YBC on the side, this is a yeast identification card, and the Vitek provides many different types of cards for different types of organisms. Again, since I had three gram-positive bacilli, I plated them on this sporulation media, which is called Finley's auger. Here's a slide at 1000X showing the different bacteria which contain the spores within. From here, I could identify the type of, the position of the spore, and then add it to my identification data so that I could come up with a positive identification. Once all of my six organisms were identified, I then went down to MBL, and under the supervision of Louis Kerr, I took these scanning electron micrographs. This first organism, which was all six of these were used in my ultraviolet experiments, is a Bacillus serious type 1. Here, in Enterobacter agglomerans, Candida lusitania, and these next three were all, all unidentifiable since they were not on any databases that I've yet searched. This is an unidentified gram-positive bacillus, as this is a gram-variable bacillus, and a gram-positive coccus. Next, I began my ultraviolet study. I had to grow each of the organisms in a liquid culture. Um, so that I could record their optical percent transmission in this machine called a colorimeter. Once the organism's percent optical transmission steadily was declining, I could consider the organism in logarithmic growth phase, a phase in which the DNA is damaged the most by the UV radiation. Here again, just a sample graph showing the logarithmic growth, the steady incline. From that past graph, I took the steepest part of the graph and replotted it, added standard deviation error bars and 95% confidence limit, fit a curve, and took that as my maximum growth rate for that organism. As shown in this chart, I found the maximum growth rate for all six of my organisms. Once they were in logarithmic growth, I serially diluted them and used 10 to the negative 3 and 10 to the negative 4 dilutions to inoculate plates for irradiation. Here, I'm spreading 0.02 cc's of the culture onto a plate um, evenly with this blue L-shaped straw. Once the plates were inoculated, I then covered half of the plate with aluminum foil, blocking out the ultraviolet irradiation, creating a 
a control from which I could <laughs> compare the exposed side of the plate, which would create a ratio allowing me to find a percentage of survival. Here I am just irradiating my cultures. Each of the organisms um, had varied exposure times depending on their resistance and sensitivity and that was found by first having a broad range and then narrowing it for each organism. Here would just be a normal data set, um, significantly reduced since I would have many more points. Um, obviously on the right hand side, um, lower exposure time and on the left hand side, greater exposure time. Here you can see, again, just from the survival curve, that the greater the exposure time, the less survival. Again, as I had done with the growth curves, I removed the steepest part of the survival curve and replotted it and found my maximum death rate. I did this for all six of my organisms I've seen here. If you'll notice, organism number 2.4 and 3.5 have possibly had subpopulations shown by a logarithmically plotted survival curve. In, on that curve, there would be a shoulder. The shoulder would signify that there would be a subpopulation. I concluded that among all my organisms studied, there was a 25-fold difference in their sensitivity level to the UVB radiation. Since there was a sensitivity, it could be suggested that the UV will have varying effects as it continues to increase on the as the level of UV continues to increase um, penetrating our atmosphere, that it will have different effects on different organisms within the soil. But since the dose at which it took to kill these microbes was so much higher than, that, than those theorized to be penetrating our atmosphere currently, it may be that the soil will not be affected as drastically as could be suggested. So at this point, until we're absolutely sure to what levels the, of ultraviolet is penetrating our atmosphere right now, we're not sure as to how dangerous the UV is going to be to our soil ecology. Thank you. Did you notice any difference between the resistance to ultraviolet by spore farmers and non-spore farmers? No, actually, because the resistance um, did not seem at all what I anticipated. Spore farmers just reacted as any other of the organisms did. The yeast, however, was the most resistant. Yes. You showed some growth rates. They flashed quickly on the screen in that lab, so I couldn't see what they were. Did you have any relationship, or did you see any relationship between growth rates, if they were sufficiently different between organisms, and their susceptibility to the um, Actually, I did drop that, and the correlation between them um, was very close to randomness, so I have to say that there was no correlation. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, in your personal opinion, uh, the weather conditions that we have, you know, with the rain, we get the, the rain and the sun, uh, do you think that it, it automatically evens itself out, or do you think that we have hysteria periods? Well, UV does penetrate through the clouds, so I don't think that the rain compared to the sun has any real bearing on the amount of here. No, but what I meant is, do you think that uh, it's just like every three years we have so much rain and every three years we have a dry spell, we either have a dry spell or a rainy spell? Uh, do you think that science is upsetting any of this? That's hard to say. <laughs> in, your, in your opinion. Uh, in your, uh, I honestly don't think so. No? Okay. Yes. Do you like my program? <laughs> yes, very much so. <laughs> Anybody else?
Thank you. Thank you very much. And stuff. Well, I'll let Andrea comment on that. <laughs> and stuff. So you go on to the state fair next, and then the international. Yes, um, but I do not have to go to the state fair. She's she can be invited directly to the international fair. So, so. our second speaker this evening is Zoli Sutz. Zoli is also a ninth grader at Falmouth Academy. And Zoli uh, received a first place award at Falmouth Academy Fair for his project, The Detectable Threshold for Lifted Weights. He was the recipient of his choice of either a leg of a sea semester cruise aboard either one of the research, of re the one of the vessels, the SSV Westward or the SSV Corwith Kramer, or he can defer his participation in a sea semester until his college career. Plus, he also received a $300 equipment budget from Deep Sea Systems International Falmouth. Zoli will also, he received a third place in the regional fair and will also be attending the state science fair um, at MIT in April. Zoli? Okay, um, I'm Zoli Suits and my project was on um, the detectable threshold for lifted weights by humans. And I got an interest in, in this topic when I took a psychology course last summer at CTY. And I really like psychology now and I wanted to do something on it. And I decided to do something dealing with um, in the field of sensory physiology because it's uh, relatively easier to do. You don't need fancy equipment or you don't have to look at hundreds of variables that you need to do with behaviorism or other fields of psychology. So what I um, tested for was I tried to find how much weight you have to add to a base weight to detect that difference. And for my setup, I used about um, seven, two seven inch PVC pipes, one inch diameter, that weighed, both of them weighed 45.66 grams, and they were pretty much identical. And I varied, I um, put rolled up pieces of paper into one of the tubes to make a difference between the two. And I gave these two weights in one hand to my subject, who was blindfolded, and asked him or her to tell me if they detected a difference. And I tested weight differences from zero to six grams by one grams. And I tested each difference about uh, seven times for each test. And I did this 19 times for each subject. Um, then I changed, I had a whole bunch of yes or no answers for each weight difference, which I then changed into uh, percentages, percentages of correct answers. And then I uh, defined what the threshold was so that I could um, plot the frequency, the, his the frequency of, the, uh, of certain thresholds. And I defined the threshold as um, the, f the first answer above 66%, uh, below which that the um, higher weight differences, all of the data averaged to above 66%. This was, the data on average for each individual test was highly variable. You could have 
20% correct at a 2 gram difference, so you could have 100% correct. So I had to put some way, I had to define it so that the, um, so that uh, chance wouldn't determine where your threshold was. And I plotted the frequency of this and hold on. And I plotted it here, and it, there, I had, there are only 18 people on this graph because out of the 19, one of them didn't have a threshold within the tested range. And from this graph, you can, it doesn't really look as if it's normally distributed or not. So I tested, I um, found the probability of having each uh, of these thresholds were better, and he plotted that on a probability paper. And probability paper is such that you can plot a um, function that has an S-curve and comes out straight. And that came out to look like this, actually. that. And I, that line though I got by um, using the method of least squares and has a correlation coefficient of 0.99. So it's pretty close to uh, normal distribution. And this is all theoretical, what I'm doing here. And then I changed the, um, that uh, line that I got by using the method of least squares, I changed it into a Cartesian scale. I plotted it here, it's the green line. And, but then I wanted to, but then I averaged all of the data at each weight difference together so that any, uh, inaccuracies would be averaged out because if you had somebody who scored really well, they could uh, adversely affect my histogram because you only have 19, 18 people. So we averaged all of the data and I got all of these points. The, and the error bars are standard error of the mean, they're not standard deviation. And the red line below it, I got just by drafting a cumulative Gaussian from the histogram using the mean and the, st and the standard deviation. And for both of these, the mean is 3.3 grams, which is sort of here. And they both are, the two lines on here are at 33 and 66 percent, and the 30, at 33 uh, percent, that's where randomness was, because the subject had three answers they could give me, that the weights weighed the same, that one was heavier, or that the other one was heavier. So this is just all randomness. And since my data is only distributed, I defined the threshold as what is detectable 50% of the time, or 50% of non-randomness, and 50% of this remaining range is 66% over here. And you can also see from my theoretical graphs that my data doesn't, it doesn't agree in the uh, upper portions with the theoretical lines, but I don't think that's relevant because the um, correlation coefficient is very high 
and the inaccuracy is only apparent when you take the averages of it, which I could reduce. I could reduce the um, error by testing a whole bunch of more people, and I could also make uh, use a chi test to determine normal distribution or not. And but generally, this method of um, asking the subject what they actually think as opposed to measuring what their neurons are signaling is ac pretty accurate. As shown from tests that Borg ran that show that um, perceived stimulus, what the subject tells you, and what um, your neurons, what your neurons are actually firing, those two are very closely related. So I don't need to measure what the neurons are, what the neuron impulses are. And also that won't be feasible because there are more than one type of neuron that measure or uh, help you differentiate between weights. And so I can conclude that the data is normally distributed and I define the threshold as 33 or 3.3 grams with plus or minus 1.7 grams, which is the standard deviation. And even though the um, averages are off with the plus or minus 1.7, the um, break here falls in that range. And uh, that's it. Any questions? How do you decide to use the subjects? Um, I just people who had time. <laughs> it's pretty random. I didn't predominantly use males or females or teenagers or adults or anybody. That's why I was going to ask for they primarily a certain age. Um, a variety. variety of ages. So I, had five or six uh, adults and same number of teenagers. Thank you. speaker this evening is Kira Grant, who's a junior at Falmouth High School. She won the first place award at Falmouth High and a $1,500 scholarship from Hui. She also won the, uh, the Salt Pond Area Bird Sanctuaries Award, and I think that's given uh, to a project of environmental significance. And tonight, Kira's presentation is on the impact of ultraviolet light on aquatic microbial populations. And Kira also won a second place at the regional fair and will also be attending the state fair. Kira? All right. Um, as they mentioned, my name is Kira Grant, and my project is on the impact of ultraviolet light on aquatic microbial population. Um, as Audrey had mentioned, some of the effects of ultraviolet light already, but I'll just add a little more to it. Um, ultraviolet radiation can have devastating and beneficial effects on nature. It is absorbed differently by various substances and colors. UV light has a wavelength approximately between 4 and 400 nanometers. It is divided into three regions, near ultraviolet light between 4 and 300 nanometers, far light between 300 and 200 nanometers, and vacuum between 200 and 2 nanometers. The vacuum region is most damaging to life, but it is absorbed by most substances, including air, so it is difficult to test its effects. The um, far ultraviolet light is the most germicidal because it is, it is absorbed primarily by organic matter. 
the bacterial cytal destruction includes many aspects such as the breaking apart of DNA chromosomes and protein damage. The sun's ultraviolet light causes these same effects, but to a lesser extent. In humans, this also causes skin cancer. The ultraviolet rays do not easily penetrate through large clumps of bacteria, so it's imperative to have uniform coverage when you're testing its effects. It is also found that the survival rate is higher among bacteria suspended in an opaque medium or covered by a colored glass. This would indicate that the effects of ultraviolet light are lessened through a pigmented material. And so when I started the first phase of this project last year, I wanted to know if a bacteria's own pigment would provide the same protection. And I tested two bacteria, Micrococcus luteus and E. coli. Micrococcus luteus is a yellow pigmented bacteria, and E. coli is non-pigmented. And I found that the Micrococcus did survive better. But I was reluctant to conclude that its survival was because of its pigment, because I had only tested one pigmented bacteria. So this year, I wanted to prove that the Micrococcus did survive because of its pigment. So I tested four pigmented bacteria, a red, a yellow, a blue, and an orange, under ultraviolet light. Then I extracted their pigments and found its absorption of ultraviolet light. And I thought that the pigments that absorbed the most ultraviolet light would best protect their bacteria from the damages. And, um, Um, I prepared plates, yeast malt agar plates, of my four bacteria. I spread 0.025 microliters of a saline dilution of the bacteria across a plate and exposed it to 40, 30, 20, and 10 seconds of exposure under 254 nanometers of light, because 254 nanometers is found to be a very germicidal wavelength. And I found that the yellow and orange bacteria, indicated right here, were um, unaffected by the ultraviolet light. But the red and blue bacteria were very affected by the light. So I then extracted the bacteria in an alcohol acetone solution. And I placed an ultrasonic probe in the solution to try to break up some of the cells. Then I centrifuged it to settle the cells to the bottom and the pigment went into the solution. I then put the pigment into a cuvex and put it through a light spectrometer. And I found its absorption of light between 240 and 800 nanometers. You can't test it any lower than 240 because um, the air absorbs the light, so it's inaccurate. And it was difficult to compare them all together because the yellow was such a light color and it absorbs so little. So I blew up all of the graphs of each of the colors. And you can see that the yellow and orange bacteria up top, no, right here absorbed most of their light in the UV range, but the red and the blue absorbed most of their light in the visible range. I then found the percent of light that was absorbed in the UV range, and I graphed it right here. And I found that the yellow and orange bacteria absorbed 70% of their light in the UV range, and the blue and the red only absorbed 30% of the light in the UV range. And the yellow and the orange were relatively unaffected by the light. And the blue and the red were very damaged by the light. So I concluded that the bacteria who absorbed the greatest amount of light in the UV range were most resilient to its effects. And this could also be used because the pigments could be placed in suntan lotions and used to protect humans from the radiation. Is there any questions? <laughs>
laboratory, I test raw aquatic. And um, I don't know the names of the bacteria except for the red one, which was Cerisia marsalis. They were just numbers, so I couldn't tell you exactly where you'd find them, but I suspect in local water. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you conclude from this that the tinting on sunglasses, perhaps the yellow or orange shaded sunglasses, would give more protection to your eyes? Yes, definitely think so. Do they put pigments at all in, in suntan lotion now? Um, I, I've noticed most of the suntan lotions are all pigmented the same color, so I don't think that's what they're using to protect you. But you could put this into, into it and it might make it more protective. Any questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Our final speaker this, this evening is Jessica Shade, who's also a junior at Falmouth High School. Jessica won a second place award, uh, and she also won the choice of her participation in a, a leg of an SEA cruise, or deferring that award until she can participate in a C semester when she's in college. And she received a $500 scholarship from Associates of Cape Cod. Jessica will also participate in the state fair and the title of her presentation this evening is The Effect of Phosphates in Fresh Water. Jessica? Um, I guess I'll begin with a brief introduction of why I decided to choose um, my project topic of the effects of different concentrations of phosphates on freshwater ecosystems. And I wanted to choose an environmentally oriented topic and I decided on phosphates because unlike other environmental topics such as ozone depletion and um, other kinds of environmental matters, um, it seems that the public really does not know much about how phosphates actually cause harm to the environment. Um, <coughs> So I went and did some research on phosphates and found that what they generally do on an ecosystem is they increase algal growth and um, rapid algal growth, which eventually results in eutrophication. And eutrophication is what occurs when there's an overgrowth of a plant life, which is usually algae. And this causes a simultaneous growth of aerobic bacteria, which consume the oxygen in the environment and can, cause, can lead to fish kills and the death of other animal populations. And what happens is this all collects on the bottom of the, um, the water body. And so you have a comp that's completely eutrophied state. Um, there are bands of some t certain types of detergents which contain phosphate builders in some of the um, United States as of today. But um, phosphates are found to be the most effective cleansers, so they still exist in many forms in detergents. And they're working on um, alternative such as nitrilotriacetic acid, but this has also been found to cause eutrophication in coastal areas. And 80% of the phosphates which enter e freshwater ecosystems come from sewage runoff. And 65% of this is from phosphate builders. And the other 35% comes from waste such as human waste and food waste, et cetera. Um, They've also found that phosphates are the most important factor in freshwater ecosystems in the stimulation of algal growth. So what I did was I created um, four uniform ecosystems in a laboratory setting. Um, I, I created them with about 2,500 milliliters of deionized water. And I began with putting a very small amount of duckweed plants and um, strands of elodia. But I found that they weren't, being, they weren't growing well under laboratory conditions. So I began to investigate why, why they were not growing properly. So I concluded that they needed to be fed some sort of mild nutrient solution because they weren't getting the nutrients that they needed in the lab setting we, because they didn't have enough of a diversity of anim, um, plant and animal life. So I had a, a mild miracle growth solution to give them enough nutrients to um, start them off. So they began to grow. And then they still, they started, the growth peaked a little bit, but they still weren't growing properly. So I concluded that it was either because of um, something, a light factor, like the, they received light 24 hours a day in the lab, 
And or I also didn't know that if this was maybe because they were not being aerated properly, because I spoke to Dr. Vaccaro in the lab, and his samples are aerated continuously. So I can, um, conducted a little kind of side experiment to figure out whether it was the light or the air. And I found that they, the reason was because they were not being aerated properly. So then I went on to, um, to actually create my solutions. And what I did was I took um, a teaspoon of the sodium phosphate tribasic because sodium phosphates, which generally found in detergents. And I took the mass of that as 100% and then multiplied it by 15%, 30%, and 45%, which was then diluted into 2,000 milliliters of water. And what I did was created a fill line for each of my containers. And as the water would evaporate, it was replaced with water with the phosphate concentration. And my hypothesis was that the control would remain the same with no abnormal algal growth, but that the 15% would be slightly enhanced because, as many of you who may be gardeners know, that a low concentration of any nutrient is beneficial to plant life. Um, and I expected that the 30% and 45% would show increased algal growth. And I wasn't exactly sure what kind of algae would be stimulated, which I later went on to investigate. But I found that they did show rapid algal growth. Um, and the 45% was significantly worse than the 30%. And what happened also was the, um, the duckweed began to pale and show signs of nitrate deficiency, which is um, they begin to pale because of lack of nitrate. And they began to shrink also and decompose. So um, I then decided to try, this was after I added these phosphate solutions after I had already cultivated um, po large populations of duckweed. So my containers were full of duckweed and melodia. But the second phase, I decided to see how the duckweed plant was affected as it was growing. So what I did was introduce smaller populations of duckweed and I added the solutions as the duckweed began to grow. And my hypothesis was similar. I um, concluded that the, fifth, the control would probably remain the same, that the 15% would be slightly enhanced. The 30% and 45% would have stunted, show signs of stunted growth, as, which would be reflected in um, the way that I had previously done the experiment, that it showed that they um, paled and started to shrink. So I can, um, conducted that experiment. And I found that um, I had stimulated the growth of types of algae, pennant diatoms, and also um, which were from, usually from the um, phyla, chrysop phyla chrysophyta. And I also saw some green algae, which is more so I noticed in the 15% than in the 30 and 45%, although there were small populations. And these were, um, this was from the phylum chlorophyta. So the last um, part of my experiment has been devoted to trying to um, narrow down the species of algae that I had grown. So um, I spoke to Mr. Cornell of the Marine Biological Laboratory about going down to his lab to look at my algal cells under his microscope, because I tried to look at to, um, them under our school microscopes. But they, we could, I could only magnify them 100 times. And for different types of algae, that's not significant enough to notice any details. So um, I went down to the lab there. And I still couldn't see them well enough under his microscope. So we moved over to the Marine Resource Center, where I could have access to a phase contrast microscope. And I looked at them under a phase contrast microscope. And I also used oil immersion, which gives you a more accurate view. And I noticed that the, um, the pennant diatoms that I had grown, which in rap they had grown rapidly in the 30% and 45%. And they were um, mostly uni unicellular, but the ones I had grown were colonial. And they were sticking to the sides and bottoms of my container. And I found them to be gomphonema. And the chlorophyta algae, the green algae that I had grown more so in the 15% and with um, small concentrations in the 30 and 45% was uh, Chlorogonium euchlorum. And I have some pictures of this. Um, both of these types of algae were found to, um, to be ecological indicators of water pollution, particularly of sewage runoff. Okay. And this is how the um, panadiatom gomphonema appeared. Um, this is, the pigment is usually in here is um, brown. They're known to be golden, golden brown algae. Okay, and the chlorogonium, which has flagella, appeared to be like this. Okay, and I also conducted um, some pH tests on the, with a pH meter in the laboratory because I suspected that I would see an increase in pH, not only because of the phosphates, but that Certain um, types of algae, mainly from the phyla cyanophyta and chlorophyta, tend to increase the pH of water. So um, I conducted 12 tests. These were, this is the levels for the control over the course. And you can see that it stayed the same in the beginning, but I noticed toward the end it began to rise slowly. But I suspect this is because the water sample I had noticed has started to have um, a type of green algae. So I fear that it may have been contaminated in some way. Um, the 15%. 
goes, you can see that the 15% is kind of a slow but steady increase in pH. And in the 30%, it's more significant. And then lastly, in the 45%. Okay. And in the first phase of my experiment, toward the end of the experiment, I didn't start to notice signs of eutrophication, which is a lot of algae growth. In. And I noticed um, the relatively the same effects in the second phase. Um, all right, are there any questions? they usually do in most cases that is where they've run off. You can see pumps. I don't know if many of you are familiar with Shibrick's Pond. They used to run sewage from Main Street businesses into that pond and you can actually see the, um, the pipes where they used to run sewage off. They've stopped doing, doing it more so now because they found they've done more research onto how phosphates actually harm the environment but they used to just, they would dump it large scale into pond areas. And they've had problems lately too. Um, in the news, if you've seen the problems down in the Everglades, where they're having phosphates not only are found in the food waste and phosphate builders and detergents, but also in fertilizers, which are composed largely of phosphates. So they've had a lot of problems with runoff into the Everglades, and, and they've had a lot of problems. Do you know much about fertilizers? Well, no, not much about fertilizers. Are there any other questions? Yes? Uh, the coalition of Pleasant Bay has also been following this thing up pretty mm -hmm. much. I'm a member, I don't do much, but I, <laughs> I'm very interested. And I live down on the bay anyway. Mm -hmm. The green is on the uh, shoreline seems to be increasing. Yes, yes it does. Because um, the type of green algae that I did find was from chlorophyll that tended to be stimulated. And that is one of the two types through. Um, in Canada and the United States, they've done experiments where they've purposely eutrophicated lakes and they've noticed that mainly the growth of um, algae from the phyllocyanophyta and chlorophyll as well. Yes? Uh, Jessica, it wasn't quite clear to me from your presentation. When you varied the phosphorus concentration, were the other essential nutrients maintained at the same level? Well, How did that work? Um, I, just added, I just added the phosphate solutions to them. You so added it at miracle growth. Um, that was all. They all started in the beginning with the Miracle Girl, but then I just stopped adding the Miracle Girl to the you ones that have phosphates. phosphates. Yes. yes. You, you. <coughs> so that could have been, I uh, yes, I see, attributed to a, a lack of nitrates in the water. Too. They're paling. Yes, the paling. Yeah. Did you do anything about uh, uh, having a limited amount of nitrate? Or did you just use the miracle grow as a starter? Yes, as a starter to, to get them, because they didn't have um, sufficient nutrients in the laboratory setting. So. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you mentioned that the algae are growing. Well, that ends our formal presentations for this evening, but I'd like to invite you all to meet our science fair winners, there's uh, cookies and tea and coffee. And please stay and meet these very exceptional young students and join me in congratulating them again. Thank you.